the previous episodes of Pip Talks Painting Children. The aim was to give you some background and a better understanding of the concept of pain in general. From now on, I'm specifically going to focus on the assessment and management of pain in children. Good day and thank you for joining us. I'm Annemarie Oberhose and today we're going to explore different ways of assessing pain in children, as well as some common misconceptions that you might find. I'm not going to discuss specific pain scales, as I believe every unit must find pain scales that will be best suited for their own population. But we're going to look at specific requirements for the assessment of pain in children. So, let's get started. First of all, it's important to remember that the specific developmental stages of a child influence their reaction to pain as well as the way pain should be addressed. As children grow and develop, they start to learn certain responses to pain and what is regarded as an acceptable response or not. However, they could also learn maladaptive thinking or coping strategies that are not helpful. The way the body process pain changes as children grow and will not be the same in a premature baby as it is in an older child. But I will address this specifically in a later episode when we focus on pain management in babies. The use of pain scales is another very important aspect to keep in mind, as not all pain scales are suitable for children of all ages. It is therefore very important to check the age range when choosing the scale. It is also important to remember that pain is a subjective experience and the person experiencing pain can determine what they want others to see and know about the pain and this is also true of children. A common misconception is that children will tell you when they are in pain and they will exaggerate the pain and even sometimes fake the pain. However, did you know that children are actually better at hiding pain than at faking pain? And this is supported by research. These researchers found that children are capable of controlling their facial expressions of pain when instructed to do so, but are better able to hide their pain than to fake it. So let's look at the different reasons why children would deny having pain and there are many reasons. In the first place, children want to protect their parents as they are very turned into the emotions of those around them and they don't want their parents to become upset or sad. Children might also assume that pain will indicate that they did something wrong, as children often see any pain as suffering as punishment for something they thought they might have done wrong. Children might be subjected to bullying or abuse, and they were threatened to keep silent, so if they talk about the pain, they might have to disclose the abuse. Or it could be that they were embarrassed by the pain, because they were told that big boys don't cry. It could be that the child is scared of further medical treatment, Children might think, whether wrongly or not, that they will get an injection for pain, or they might simply hate the pain syrup or tablets that they know they will get. Sometimes, smaller children find it difficult to locate or understand the pain, especially if there is no obvious reason, such as an open wound, and they don't know how to tell you. Or they assume you know already, you know, adults know everything, right? And last but not least, children want to please adults. If you ask a child about his or her pain and you seem to be disappointed that the pain medication didn't work, the child might assume that you are disappointed with him or her. Likewise, it's nice for a child if you are impressed with what he, that he or she does not have pain anymore, so they might look for your approval and deny any pain that they may have. And this is all backed by research. These authors agree that parents' reaction to pain is likely to influence the child's response to pain. So we know that children might deny having any pain, making it difficult to manage their pain. But apart from that, there are a number of factors influencing the reaction of healthcare staff, such as the knowledge and training on childhood pain, and we know that there is a huge gap in medical and nursing curricula. Our own experience with pain might influence our perceptions of pain in others, 
as well as a way we judge others and personal biases that we may have. I want you to pause this video for a while and focus on the children's faces one by one. Ask yourself, if this child tells me that he or she is in pain, will I believe the child? Okay, so we all know that you're supposed to believe a child when he or she tells you they're in pain, but deep down inside, you most probably will tend to believe one child more than the next. We had many interesting discussions in the workshop that I've previously done in person, and I can assure you that your opinions are not necessarily the same as the next person. We all have an upbringing bringing, and personal experiences that makes us biased towards certain children. And we may want to think that certain children may be more vulnerable to pain or even more prone to exaggerate pain. And we can be influenced by the gender, facial expressions, economic class or even the race of the child. So be aware of this bias, preferably working on it so that you can become as unbiased and non-judgmental as possible and make sure that you believe each and every child telling you they've got pain. With so many factors playing a role, detecting pain in children can therefore be a huge challenge. So let's look at different pain scales and methods available to assess pain. As you can see, there are many ways of assessing pain and we should implement all these methods or at least as many as possible to make sure that we don't miss any pain in children. So first up is self-report scales and measures. This can only be used in the verbal child, so naturally excludes a number of children. It's also important to, first of all, explain the concept of pain to the child. Children's perception of what pain is can influence their pain reporting and we need to ensure that we are all on the same page here. So how do you explain pain to a child? You will find this pain booklet on the PEP website listed here, but let's quickly run through some of the information. Explain that pain is a feeling similar to heat, cold or tickling. After going through earlier episodes of these PEP talks, we as adults know now that pain is so much more, but it's not necessary to confuse children with too much information. Pain is the alarm system of the body and will alert us when something goes wrong, similar to the warning light on the dashboard of a car. Clarify that you can sometimes feel more pain than at other times. This is also a good time to what we call calibrate a pain scale for children. It is important that children understand the scale and know what the different components mean. Use examples of previous painful experiences that the child may have had and help the child to find the appropriate response. For instance, you can ask the child to think about the worst pain he or she ever experienced and point out that that will be the worst hurt ever on the face's pain scale. Next, ask the child to think about something that hurts only a little bit and point out that you will that will be the hurt just a little bit face. It's important that you know what the child's word is for pain, but also explain to the child that some people might use different names to avoid any confusion in future. It's often difficult for children to understand they can have pain when they can't see anything. So sometimes when asked where the pain is, a small child in the emergency room would point to the old scab on her knee that she can see instead of the broken arm that does not look as if there's anything wrong with it. It's therefore important to explain to children that pain can be in different parts of the body even though you can't see it. Make children aware that there are different kinds of pain and that all pain does not feel the same. So, now that the child understands the concept of pain a bit better and you've calibrated the scale, you can start using a self-report scale. Let's look at what is available. I'm sure you're all familiar with the faces pain scale and this is the most common scale used with children in hospital. But please note, that this is only an example of a self-report scale measuring pain intensity. There are many other scales all combined in this one scale. To me measure pain intensity, you also get visual analog scales, meaning that you use small increments on a vertical or horizontal line, such as depicted here. You can also use numbers 
but only an older child or adolescent with adequate numeracy skills. Verbal rating scales give verbal descriptions of the pain. Or you can use colours where blue or green is typically depicted as non-threatening and therefore signifies no pain, and red as indicating significant pain. If you happen to find yourself in a situation where self-report pain scales on pain intensity are not available, things like poker chips, pebbles of the same size or even similar buttons were found to be effective as a pain scale. Again, very important to calibrate the scale for the child so that one item means a little bit of pain and five items mean the worst pain ever. Never use more than five items for this scale. You would have noticed that I specifically pointed out that these scales only measure pain intensity. It's important to note that when we describe pain according to intensity alone, it's like describing music according to volume alone. And you will have no idea whether I'm listening to classical music or rock, whether it's a fast, exciting rhythm or slow and calm, or whether I even like the music or not. So the measurement of pain only starts with the scales discussed just now. But this is by far not the only measurement of pain. We also need to ask the child the location of the pain, and it might be difficult for children to just point out the area. What has been found very really helpful is to present the child with a soft toy or a doll or body outline and ask him or her to point out the area of the pain or to colour it in on the outline. Sometimes the colour that the child picks or the uh, intensity with which he or she colours in may be an indication of the pain intensity as well, but obviously that's not validated. That requires special skills from the assessor to interpret. With chronic or recurrent pain, it may also help to keep the child, uh, to ask the child, obviously with the help of the parents, to keep a pain diary. This might indicate what triggers the pain, what makes it worse, and can even assist in finding a specific diagnosis. As mentioned previously, children can deny pain or they may be too small uh, or find it difficult to report their pain. It's therefore very important to always look for any other indication of pain in the child. And we have a number of behavioural observation scales that have been validated to use in children. I'm not going to go into the details of the different scales, but let's consider what it looks like when children are in pain. So let us consider what it looks like when children are in pain. Children may want to protect the sore area, not wanting anyone to come near, rubbing or clutching the area, or even trying to move away from the area by lying skew in the bed. They may be tense, pulling up their legs, or even completely lying in the fetal position, or just being very quiet and withdrawn. Head banging is usually associated with autistic behaviour. However, children often revert to this behaviour when in pain. Children can also become irritable, aggressive, or hyperactive. And the gnashing of teeth or grimace often indicate pain. Drooling may be an indication of a sore throat as a child doesn't want to swallow. Disrupted or reduced sleeping patterns may be an indication of pain, but not always. Another sign, sign may be loss of appetite, but be aware, small babies have a tendency to start sucking when in pain and therefore breastfeeding or sucking on a dummy can actually be used to alleviate short-lived pain, such as during procedures, but more about that later. Other signs may include a tight fist, toes curling up or pressing down, or the whole body of the child can become tense and restless. Oh yes, we are too familiar with the crying of a small baby, but it is often difficult to know whether this is because of pain or not. Signs to look out for is a bulging brow and frowning, eyes closed and an open mouth and stiff tongue. If 
You can detect pain not only through behavior, but also by looking at the child's physiological measures. Tachycardia, quick and shallow breathing, sweating, hypertension, as well as a decrease in oxygen saturation in babies can all be an indication of pain. However, keep in mind that during chronic pain, the body has adjusted to the pain and these symptoms will no longer apply. And last but not least, talk to the parents. Parent or caregiver report is very important to help us getting to know the child better. Never assume that you know how a child is going to respond. Always ask. First of all, ask the parents what the child knows about the illness. Or has anyone explained the concept of pain to the child and what the treatment entails? What word does the child use for pain? What are the child's typical behaviour when in pain? Cry excessively, try to be stoic, etc. And are there any coping strategies that the child normally uses? Does the child get along with his or her peers? Remember that children suffering from chronic pain are more prone to bullying. However, bullies can also physically hurt children while threatening them to keep quiet so that they won't talk, that they won't talk about it. What are the previous pain experiences of the child, such as that the child was in neonatal ICU after birth, as this may influence the child's reaction towards pain? And lastly, how are painful episodes normally treated at home? Does the parents fuss about it and give medication or just brush it off? Have you ever heard people saying that children with autism spectrum disorder have a reduced sensitivity to pain and pain management is not so important in this population? There are actually people who believe this, but this is obviously not true. In fact, the facial expressions and body language of children with autism often did not match pain scores or descriptors. So if you just use observation for pain assessment, it may result in under treatment of pain in this population. We should be vigilant and note small changes, such as not using one limb as often as the other. Autism spectrum disorder has many challenges with regards to pain management. Impaired communication skills complicate the self-report of pain, and research findings are inconsistent. Some research, research found an increased pain expression in children with autism. Idiosyncratic behaviours, atypical sounds and facial expressions complicate observation, and it's different interpretations of pain by different observers. Difficult, it's also difficult for these children to integrate and interpret sensory and emotional experiences. And it's difficult to differentiate between anxiety and pain. And therefore, the hospital environment with these blinding lights and strange sounds can be terrifying for these children and cause an increase in pain experience. Because autism is on a spectrum, we should never generalize and interviews with parents are of the utmost important importance to determine how a specific child will react. People also often think because children with autism find it difficult to interpret facial expressions, they will also not be able to use a faces pain scale. However, research by Ellie shows that at least 38% of these children can use a faces pain scale, but it's obviously to a much lesser extent than other children and 11% cannot use any scale at all. Children with neurological or developmental disabilities are also often neglected with regards to pain management. Again, we should never generalize and aspects to include in a pain scale are vocal sounds, eating habits, sleeping habits, social interaction, facial expressions, activity, and the body and limbs also note subtle changes in posture and movement. Physiologically, it's also important to look out for shivering, colour, sweating, breath holding, etc. And as you can see, these are all things that can differ greatly amongst children. And this is why researchers came up with the individualised numeric rating scale, where parents can describe the typical reactions of their child 
when I think the child should have a lot of pain versus when he or she is not in pain. The scripts is used are things like the child's facial expression, body movement, activity or change in social interaction, cry or vocalization, and whether the child is consolable or not. This scale might pose a number of challenges, but it's better than not addressing pain in this population at all. And lastly, you can also look at the International Children's Palliative Care Network, the ICPCN. They have a pain assessment tool that can be used by children and it's available on their website for free on the website or the, at the top of the screen. So today we're done with pain assessment and with the next episode we will start to address the vast topic of pain management in different areas. Stay tuned. Thank you.